Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard, and this is a Tesla Model 3 Highland Long Range. Our car, we've bought it. I've done a couple of days in it. Lots of reviews to follow. Uh, but in this video, look, it's Monday morning, come to work, and I want to crawl through all the differences in a bit more detail between this and the previous generations of Tesla Model 3. So we've got one of our cars here we call Graham. That's a 2019 Model 3 long range. Then in 2021, there was a bit of a refresh. Quite a lot of changes came through. And I've got an example of a post-2021 car here. Again, also a long range. And then now, of course, our brand new Highland. So, I'm going to go through. Let's see what exactly all the differences are. There's plenty of them. It's always been evolving, uh, but these are the three main Model 3s and how does the Highland improve? All right, now, before I get into this video, make sure you've subscribed to our channel, especially if you want to see lots more about this Model 3 Highland. We've got lots of tests coming up. Now, this is one of our cars that we've bought, so lots of real-world usage. Run it alongside other Teslas, other electric vehicles as it goes to work this week when we're driving around the country. So make sure you're subscribed. A lot of our viewers are not, so hit subscribe and like if you want to see lots of content about the Model 3 Highland, lots about Teslas, lots about other EVs, and lots of comparisons. So one of the obvious things really is the design of the front and the headlights. So one thing the Model 3 uh, hasn't had today is matrix headlights. Now we saw in the 2019 car, these are just fixed LED headlights. They're okay, but they've been left behind a little bit. In the refresh ones now, when you look closely in here, you've got the kind of round eye. They're kind of matrix capable, uh, but there's been no active matrix as yet. And you've got the daytime running light at the top here. Now, one of the, my biggest gripes with the Model 3 has been these headlights. So they're nice and bright and white, but no active matrix, although they should be capable of it. Maybe it will come with software update, but also the beam pattern. It's a very distinctive kind of L shape and actually kind of goes up quite a lot on, that, on our side, left-hand side, and can quite easily blind people in the left-hand lane. I don't think it's a brilliant pattern. Now, as we come to the Highland, now, obviously it's a different shape now, uh, different shape running lights that run along the bottom here and that they are matrix capable. Now, in the UK at the moment, they're not active matrix, but it's highly rumored that one of the forthcoming software updates will switch them on. So I'm really looking forward to that. And we'll be doing some more videos about the headlights as soon as that happens. What I will say, with these ones, from my uh, brief testing over the last couple of days so far, a much flatter beam pattern. You don't have that very high thing on the left, so you're not blinding everybody. And it seems to be quite good at, um, actively leveling as well. It kind of, I got in my car and on my driveway and they leveled out, you can see that. Then when I drove down the road, it was actually a little bit low, but it didn't take long. They suddenly then adjusted themselves up. So they seem to be already be better at self-adjusting and finding the right level. And they're nice and bright and white with a good um, broad pattern. Really looking forward to seeing when the active matrix turns on. Hopefully that is coming soon. Possibly this week, it's rumored. We'll let you know, of course. The earlier cars, as long as it was a long range or performance, also had front fog lights. New car, nope, nothing. And there's no option for front fog lights on the menu, so there doesn't seem to be anything in here. I have to say, I don't think that's really an issue. Front fog lights, I don't think are particularly a useful thing, but no longer front fog lights. And the whole profile of the front has changed so that it's allegedly more aerodynamic and therefore even more efficient. So the whole front bumper is, of course, different. The Highland is actually three centimeters longer than the previous cars. Same width, three centimeters longer. And actually you can just about see when you see them side by side, how it is just a, comes out a little bit more. I think that whole three centimeters is in the front bumper here. So in the front it has changed. How much junk is in your front? Well, look, they're pretty similar really, uh, but the earlier cars were cool. They had these bag hooks here. So if you had a bag in the front there, it was pretty good. Uh, you can see you've got your windscreen washer at the top here. And then these bits were sort of sloped in here, a little step down. And then we've got a little protective mat in our one, but there's a towing eye there. Now, when we go to the refresh model, the shape's changed a little bit. The bag hooks have gone, the towing eye is in there, and you've got this kind of little more of a square step here. Now, when we go to the Highland, we go back almost to the first one. We've got kind of a slopey bit here. The towing eye is over here. There's still an emergency front release at the front here. Now, the washer fluid has changed to here. The profile at the front has changed. Now, I've got a tape measure in my pocket because I've been trying to measure it. We sort of think this one looks a little bit smaller, but actually, when you sort of try and measure things like that, there could be a few millimetres, centimetre or so difference between them, but I think the space is pretty much the same. It's just the shape of the box has changed. Profile underneath here under the bonnet has changed as well. So it's obviously manufactured completely differently. You see the earlier cars are just kind of, I quite like this actually, sort of hexagon shape here. Quite like that. That's the 21 and the 19 had that. This has all changed now, possibly to 
uh, help with pedestrian impact protection. And one thing that has changed is that this one has these uh, little struts here. Um, I think these are the little explosive struts. If you do hit a pedestrian, it will burst the, the bonnet up to allow more absorption of impact. And we didn't have that on the earlier cars. So the standard wheels on the earlier cars, uh, have the 18 inch wheels, same tire size, two, three, five, 45, 18 And the standard, they used to come with Michelin Pilot Sport 4s. Now we've got the same size, 18 inches of standard wheels and also 235, 45, 18, but they're Michelin E Primacy T2 tires. So maybe these will help a little bit of efficiency. Are the wheels interchangeable between them? Well, we'll probably do some testing on that. So we'll be looking in a bit more detail about things like that. Now you can take these aero covers off here. These are called the photon wheels. These do come off and you've got a reasonable looking wheel behind it, actually like before. Uh, quite a nice design. So again, we'll show you a bit more of that in more detail in due course. Are the wheels gonna be interchangeable? So if you've got a set of nice alloys for an earlier car, will they fit on this? I think they probably would, although TPMS sensors could be different because the Fremont cars, the early ones have got different TPMS to these Shanghai cars. Are these ones interchangeable? We don't know. Something that that's gonna follow on later on if we find out. Any difference in performance? Well, 0 to 60 is quoted at the same time for this, but some sources, depending on where you read it, because Tesla don't tell you, is that this has slightly more output, slightly more horsepower to it by a few. Uh, to drive, I haven't been able to notice a difference yet. Top speed though has changed. So 125 miles per hour apparently, 140 something miles per hour on the older cars. I thought it'd be fun to add acceleration boost. So with the previous cars, you could go on the app and buy your acceleration boost to make the car faster. However, it's not there. I cannot add acceleration boost this car. Will it come, won't it come? I don't know, but it's not available at the moment, not in the UK. We don't think the brakes have changed. Uh, we're, again, we'll look into more detail, but the specs will read exactly the same. What has changed is the steering suspension. So firstly, uh, one of the main things that the Model 3 Highland promised is a more comfortable suspension. Now, one of the main criticisms of the early Model 3 was they were quite firm cars. Uh, this one, my first impressions, yes, it is certainly more comfortable to drive. It's not like a wafty Mercedes S-Class, but it's just uh, nice and refined. It's good comfort, and the sound from bumps doesn't kind of travel in and, and translate into the cabin as much. It's much more refined, and it is a smoother ride. Now, the other thing we noticed looking at the specs is that the turning circle and the steering ratio has changed a little bit. So two turns lock to lock, and a turning circle of 11.6 meters. According to this one, it's 2.14 turns lock to lock and a turning circle of 11.7 meters. So there's not much in it, but a little bit of difference there and not quite as fast a steering rack, but when you drive it, it's still the sort of typical Model 3 fast steering rack. It would feel quite familiar if you're used to one of these. Now the washer nozzles, there's two on each arm here. On the early cars, it's one on each arm. There's a difference I haven't read about before. Let me show you a bit about door trims. Fascinating, huh? Uh, the earlier car, actually slightly squishy. Quite a good plastic down here, a little bit squishy plastic. Then we come to the refresh 2021 cars. A very hard plastic. Actually gone back a step, if anything. Then we go to the new car. Is it better? Yes, it's gone back to squishy again. So there we go. Oh, is this a new thing, a reflector in the door? Is that in that door? Okay, that was always there. <laughs> Now, when you get to the side and you're looking at this bit, it all looks very much the same. Uh, this car came as standard with some front mud flaps fitted. Uh, coming back here, now the mirrors, everything here looks the same. Now the cameras are slightly different. So this is now camera hardware version four. Uh, and it's got a slightly different profile. Kind of, I think it sticks out a little bit more on this uh, wing camera. And the shape here is slightly different. So this here for the B pillar camera is a much more kind of round aperture compared to the more oval aperture there. Uh, door handles seem the same. I'd love to have seen lights in a door handle, especially in a black car. I can promise you at night, you just can't see these door handles. Now, it would be no trouble at all, I'm sure, for Tesla to put a little LED light on there that comes on when you get near it. You can even buy aftermarket handles that have that kind of stuff. Why is it not on there? Did nobody, when they were testing these cars at Tesla, ever go out in the dark? I don't know. It's, it's this little thing, but it would be really good just to have lights and a door handle so you can see where to open them. Right, okay, let's carry on backwards. So I've been measuring the height from the floor to the bottom of the wheel arches here, and that seems the same across all three of them. So whilst they've made the suspension uh, softer with some more travel to it, the height of the car does seem to be the same. All right, tape measure away. Let's continue to the back of the car. So around the back of the cars, the first two versions look much the same, but the earlier cars didn't have a power tailgate. You had to just manually open them like that. No great shakes. 
then in 2021, you got the power tailgate as standard. So that pops open, but the design really looks all much the same. Then we go to the Highland, which now has completely different rear lights. There's much thinner light design down here. And what they've done is they've put the reversing lights and the fog lights in the back here. And in fact, a light has to come on there when the tailgate's open as well. So of course, still power tailgate because these lights will disappear, leaving you no lights here. And it is legislation. You have to have some kind of light on at the back in case you're broken down on the hard shoulder. Although as I open the car here, no lights are on. And I thought that would need to be the case. Now, one thing I have noticed with this car initially was this, the opening, it's not as high up. Um, it is sometimes, <clears throat> okay, that, that's closing then. <laughs> Got there in the end. So this, this is kind of like right there. Um, it doesn't seem to open up as far. That's as far as it goes. It's got a double powered strut here. Now, if I go back to the earlier car, single powered strut here, and you can see it's just more open here. It's nicer actually, and less chance of banging my head, which is the same as the earlier car with no power struts. Again, opens up nice and wide. In fact, even a little bit more, uh, and therefore there's no chance of me banging my head on anything. So I have to say on the Highland, that's not such a good thing really, is it? And again, you can see here the difference. So I'm not so keen on that. Now let's have a look at the boot space itself. Has it changed? Out comes the tape measure again. Now this width here, 105 centimeters down to at the bottom here, about 106 centimeters. That's about the same at the bottom there. And it's about the same at the top there. That's about the same. That's about the same. So the opening doesn't seem to have particularly changed. At 48 as I use it like that. 48. And this bit here as well. So the early cars, if you open the tailgate quickly, the water, off, if it was raining, would then run down into the boot. With the power tailgate, it's not so bad because it opens a bit slower and has more of a chance to run off. That design hasn't seemed to have changed. So it was a bit of a criticism and they haven't really done anything to change that. Uh, that I can tell. So water, if it was really fast running, could potentially kind of splash down, but not really an issue. 48. So the opening looks the same. Let's get inside it. I think it's going to be the same. 107. Now, the new car actually has a little fluffy bit along the back here, a little lined bit there. So across the floor, 107. Let's go dead in the middle, 107. The early cars have got this harder plastic there. Is it the same? 107, yes. And then the old one's gonna be the same as that. We've got a load liner in this one. Yep, same as that. So I've just been measuring between the wheel arches as well. And I think it's the same, possibly half a centimeter narrower in that car, but I can't really pick apart the difference leaning like that. Let's call it the same. So one change you do have in the boot is on the older cars, this is kind of panelled in here. On the newer cars, that's now open. So you've actually got space to kind of go right across there and then down into a little pocket as well. So I think in the older cars, you had the, the sub was there. That's obviously been repositioned and you've got a little bit more space down the side. The rear camera's in the same place at the back here. Uh, we've got slightly better plate holders that don't rattle around like you could get on earlier cars. You don't have the single T badge in the middle now. You've got Tesla spelt out with these little kind of chrome stick on bits. So if you ever need paint on the back, you're gonna have to stick on a few things now. Of course, the new cars, no parking sensors across the back here. So I'll show you how it looks for the parking visuals. And then all this kind of rear diffuser and tray with these rear lights, that's all changed a bit as well. So it's the inside where there's more changes. Let's take a look at that. You notice straight away from the door closure, it's more solid. Uh, and by the way, have you noticed this? Look, when I open the window, the window down, it just comes up a little bit. Then it goes down so the door glass doesn't rattle in the doors. The early cars, it just kind of rattles around when you close the door with a, a lowered window. The dashboard's different now. You can see we've got ambient lights. We've got Alcantara that goes across here. Fortunately, we've seen the back of the wood. Uh, mind you, we used to change loads of cars with the wooden dashboard to Alcantara trim. So that bit of the business is probably going to decline, but it's good that there isn't wood trim in here anymore. It looks more modern for it. We've got this kind of nice gray material here. Oh, that could be Alcantara, couldn't it? Anyway, come on to that. But we've still got that kind of single slot air vent, 
Then we've got this kind of gray material, which is nice. Similar nice low dashboard, that's the same, but of course we've got this light strip that travels across. Do you see reflections in the windscreen from this? You do a little bit actually from this curve profile. You can see it really in the corners. It's not intrusive. I wouldn't worry about it at all, but you do see just a little bit of reflection and a little bit coming up on the corners. So there is a little bit of reflection, but I don't think it's really a problem. So here, nice materials. Look, squidgy, nice, good stuff. And we've still got two phone chargers here, which is good. Now this screen has changed slightly. Uh, it has got different bezels. It's ever so slightly bigger apparently, and it's got higher resolution. To use it, it uh, seems the same. Doesn't really feel any different there, if I'm honest. Uh, you do see a couple of changes. For example, when I change the volume, you get the option to adjust uh, volume, whether you're playing from the rear media or the front. So we've got the screen in the rear now, so I can show you uh, a bit more of that when I get in the back. Different consoles, so sliding cubby holes here to cover your cup holders now. The cup holders, by the way, do have little springy nodules in them. I don't know, what the, what's the correct term for little springy nodule bits that hold your stuff? But basically, if you've got a cup which isn't exactly the size of the cup holder, it used to rattle around all over the place, and now it's better because it wedges in nicer. Uh, so they're nice and rubbery with little squidgy springy bits. Uh, the space in this console here seems much the same. The 12 volt uh, socket is down at the front there now. It used to be tucked in behind here. Uh, we can close these little covers up as well when not in use. And this is a nice gray material. You may remember the early cars, you got that black shiny gloss. Um, and then on the refresh cars, they went to a nicer center console material here without the flappy open things. And then they had this, so that's, that's the same there. Similar here, you've got an armrest with some storage underneath it here. I didn't get a tray in the top here like I've seen in a lot of the previous cars. So a lot of those have been retrofitted trays from Amazon. But there is a little space that you could probably add one and keep some sunglasses in here. So that brings me on. There's still no kind of dedicated sunglasses holder. I'd like to see that. Would have been good up here. Um, and whilst we're up here, actually, I can show you. Up here is your kind of backup for selecting park, reverse, neutral, drive. Um, and if I press it there, it lights up. So you can see park, reverse, and neutral drive. And that's there. If I want to select drive, I can do that. But normally you do it from the screen. It's kind of like a backup system, I think. Let's say your screen was smashed to bits. You just put a bit of wood through it. Um, so normally now, uh, where you would have had drive here, you can select drive here forwards, drive here uh, to go reverse and then tap that for park. Although if you're in drive and you just open the door, it goes to park automatically anyway. So that brings me on to this bit. There's no stalks and we've got a different steering wheel. There's no drive selector stalk. That's on the screen or up there. But what that will do, by the way, is, is sort of automatically select. And initially it had to calibrate cameras for like the first day it was doing that. Uh, but they've now calibrated and it's starting to work. So I got in the car in a car park, there was another vehicle in front. So it just assumed I had to go backwards. So I didn't have to select anything. And I think that will become very much second nature. In a lot of cases, you'll just get in the car and it will just go, well, you have to go forwards because there's a wall behind you. Um, let's hope it does that. I'll let you know if I reverse through any walls. Uh, but what's it like initially if you do have to select kind of forwards for drive, reverse? Well, I've been fine with this to be honest, been getting used to it, no problem at all there. But the stalks, right, back to the stalks. One of the most contentious points about the new Model 3 Highlanders is that there are no stalks on it. And you have to select your indicators from the steering wheel buttons here. They're both on the same side, so it's not like you've got right here, left here. And how are they? Well, I'm still getting used to it. There are still times when I kind of go like this and automatically kind of go to grab it. What I will say is, I think I am getting used to it, uh, especially, you know, kind of left turn signal there, right there. You've got to remember the Model 3 has a very fast steering rack, so it takes quite a sharp turn to need to do more than that. Most roundabouts are just kind of this and this, so you can quite easily kind of select between them. You do get used to it, actually. It's really the tighter roundabouts where you like this, and then you're changing direction where you would need to do this. And that's where you do have the problem. Now, there's not really an easy way around that, is there? Uh, why Tesla have done this? Is it because there's less parts and components? Well, you've then since had to add more buttons on the steering wheel, so I don't really see that. Maybe in California Design Studio, they didn't consider the need for roundabouts particularly. We have lots of roundabouts in the UK and throughout Europe. 
And I think one thing that might help is, I'm sure there'll be a day where they automatically indicate, so the, the system, it'll know you're going round and roundabout and taking the third exit. So you do this and then it should automatically change. I think that'll be possible quite easily um, and possibly quite soon, where it will actually automatically indicate in a lot of cases as well. So uh, I am getting used to it. I don't think it's all bad. It's a kind of unnecessary move really, isn't it? But if it helps with the simplicity of design the way forward, I think we'll get used to it. But there are going to be times, especially to begin with, where it is a bit weird and awkward. Now, look, I've only been using this car for a couple of days and uh, I'll be using it a lot more as we start using it for work as well this week. And so I'll keep you updated how I'm getting used to the indicators. Am I just going to become what we at least used to call a stereotypical BMW driver? We just don't bother indicating, that's possible. Will you get used to it and will there just be a few scenarios where it's a bit awkward, but you kind of naturally learn it? It could be the case. It's a strange decision, um, but let's see what comes of that. So that's my thoughts so far on that. Otherwise, the steering wheel feels really nice. Again, it's, it's quite sort of Model 3, you know, it's quite small. It feels really nice in the hands. It's a nice size. It feels good quality. The materials are lovely. Uh, I've been getting used to fine with the wiper washers and the flasher headlights. That's been okay, to be honest. Uh, it's been a bit clumsy selecting kind of cruise and autopilot sometimes clicking this in and it doesn't engage it, then it does. I'll see how that goes, possibly user error, but uh, I'll let you know how I'll get on with that in future videos. So again, make sure you stay subscribed. Right, onto the seats. Okay, so one of my other criticisms of the previous Model 3s is that the seats could have been better, I think. They were okay and a lot of people really loved them. Um, for me personally, I found at least there wasn't much sort of side support, especially when you're in a performance car and you take a performance car to the track, you could just slide around all over the seat. There was no real side support. Uh, for me as well, I found they were a bit squishy and the seat bases just always felt a little bit short. Uh, plus on a warm day, they would get a bit sweaty. It's not leather, it never has been in the Model 3. It's a, a, a fake leather. It's quite a convincing, nice material, but they would get a little bit sweaty and damp on a warm day. Now, with the new Highland, we've got ventilated seats, which uh, seem to be great. So again, when I go to my climber and I've got uh, an auto setting, but I can now switch between hot and uh, heat and cool, which is nice. And so I can have ventilated seats, which is really gonna help with that. Uh, they do have more bolsters now, which is really nice. Is it better? Is it a bigger base? Well, I think the seat base may be a tad better. It's a better shape. But I, if I'm honest, I would still like it just that little bit longer and adjustable thigh support would be nice just to get it exactly right. For me, again, it's just, it just doesn't feel quite long enough and not what I'm used to. So the length of the seat base in the old cars, oh, it's a bit hard with this kind of tape measure, but I'm gonna go 52, 52 to the edge. Yeah, that's the same, 52 as it rolls around the edge there. But I think it's just not quite as squishy, so therefore it feels a bit better. Right, seat base in a Taycan. So if, if I measure my Taycan, which has got the non-adjustable ones, so this is the fixed base, it's 54, 55. And that's why I prefer a seat base in a Taycan, it's just that little bit longer. A Model S seat base, 54, 55, same as a Taycan. Three centimeters shorter. But I think they are more comfortable. There's certainly more side support. Again, I would have liked to see maybe some adjustable headrests and a nicer, squishier, soft headrest. This is quite a firm, hard thing that you can't adjust. So it would have been nice to have though, you know, some adjustable thigh support and an adjustable, squishy headrest. Um, yeah, but my experience so far is they seem comfortable. They seem good. Uh, so I'm not going to particularly complain, but it just would have been nice to have that. You know, I, again, I, I get in and out lots of different cars and when you get one with a nice, squishy headrest, I quite like it. Maybe it's not as good in accidents or something, but you know, yeah, it would have been nice. So in the back, again, some nice kind of squishier materials lowered down, not the hard plastics. Uh, it feels really much the same in here where my knees are quite high up. Because my front seat is quite low down, I can't get my feet under the seat in front. Uh, on the passenger side, it's slightly lifted up, so it is possible. My daughter's 14, quite tall, um, and she hasn't complained, it's quite comfortable. I think in terms of like space and seating position, it really feels much the same as the previous one. For adults, fine. I wouldn't want to be in it for like a long full day just because your knees are quite high up and I can't move my feet around that much. Uh, and you can squish three in. Uh, but 
look, nice, nice material. It does, everything feels nice and premium and good. You've got that slightly harder seat backs here. It's not just rock hard plastic, it's firmer, but it feels nice and durable. And then we've got the armrest is now like this with a couple of cup holders here. Uh, so that tucks away again, sort of fixed firm headrest. Now, one thing you would have noticed in the back here now is the screen. The Model 3 previous ones had heated rear seats, but you'd usually get, Dad, can you put my heated seat on in the back? Well, now just go and do it yourself. See, you've got a little screen down here with a few menu options on it. So I can turn this on and I can adjust my fan direction in the back here as well. And you can adjust your fan speed and you can also put your heated seats on yourself. There's an option here to move that passenger seat forward, which I presume doesn't work if somebody's in it. So, can you sit in that front seat, strap yourself in, and I want to test whether I now can't move it if you're in that seat. Right. I can still move you around. Can you imagine this getting in trouble with the kids in the back of this? They're like, I'm just going to put you forward. Stop it, behave in the back. Ah, exactly. So, I wouldn't have thought it'd be too hard for Tesla to kind of code in a bit of line that says, if someone sat there, don't make the seat adjustable. You can imagine all sorts of trouble going forward here, can't you? It's going to work well in drive. Well, I don't know. Let's try it. Give me the camera. Well, let me just put the cone. Give me the camera. Let's have a look. Do you know when, when you get in and out of the car, it does move more because you can see it's softer, like it moves in that. Okay, right. That's reverse, that's drive. Okay, so can I move the front passenger seat? No, it's greyed out whilst you're driving. Uh -huh, told you. I can't get the camera down there. It's, but we, no, as soon as you stop, I can move it. So I can still annoy mum. Look at that. If someone's in that front seat, it should just be off. Okay, right, well. So aside from moving the front passenger side, what else do we have here? Well, we've got here some separate audio controls, plus, crucially for kids, you can go to theatre, you can open Netflix, YouTube, Twitch, go to YouTube here, and lo and behold, oh, look at this, look, some guy picking up his new Model 3 Highland. Screen looks good, it's good quality, that's nice, and then we've got some theatre, some games as well play games in the back here and here's a little settings menu where you can add something like headphones so I went out and bought a pair of Bluetooth headphones for 29 pounds for my daughter here and I managed to pair these JBL Bluetooth headphones they were like 29 pounds from Argos um, they just paired straight up absolutely fine and of course now she can listen to YouTube or Netflix in the rear with the headphones on and we're listening to radio music in the front separately. That's quite cool. That's going to keep the kids happy. I guess one thing I would say about this is this the screen is standard. Cool. Thanks very much for your generous tester. Thank you. Now, if you've got kids in booster seats and their feet are kind of in the air around here, how easy is it for kids to kind of kick this? How liable is this to being booted in and broken? I don't know, you know, yeah, it could be, couldn't it? You know, kids on a booster seat, kick it, uh, yeah. I guess there's a bit of a risk there, but you're just gonna have to manage your kids, I guess. Uh, right down here, this used to be plastic. This is now carpet, you see here. So gone to that harder plastic there. And whilst we're right down low level, I can show you these little door bars here. Uh, so the front and rear doors have these little kind of hooks that go into here, and that helps with side impact protection, apparently. Uh, down in here, I can see a little ambient light up there now. Carpeted door pockets, squishier materials, Alcantara, ambient lights. All quite reasonable, really. Oh, got double glazing at the back. Did the last ones have double glazing at the back, Serge? Let's have a quick look. So, so yes, double glazing at the back, where the previous ones didn't, although the Model Y does have double glazing. In fact, this has apparently acoustic glass pretty much all around it. Uh, one other little difference I've, I've missed out, I mean, there'll be a few little bits, but there's also a, a sort of red light in this uh, little piece of door trim here, behind, it looks like a speaker behind it. There's a red light that comes on when you're uh, indicating and there's something in the lane next to you, a blind spot warning system. So a little visual red light there, it's a nice little simple thing to add, I think that's good. So there we have it, there's been quite a lot of changes. 
throughout the car. It is an evolution rather than a revolution. It's not a completely new thing. But as always, it's gone forward a step in the right direction. And what this really has now is that more comfortable ride, the refinement. It is quieter in the cabin. There are things like enhanced Bluetooth. There are things like noise cancelling. There are some more speakers. The sound system, by the way, I'll mention briefly. Again, I've only had this car a couple of days and still testing it. You do not really need to turn up any sub or bass in this. Again, the behind the camera is going to disagree. He likes his bass, but it's a big, deep sound system in this. In fact, if the bass is up or the sub's up, it's very boomy. So it's certainly powerful, but maybe, you know, we'll see how good the quality is over time. It will help once the speakers probably bed in a little bit as well. We'll see how it changes. So there will be a separate video about the audio system entirely. Um, in terms of connectivity and the Bluetooth and voice call quality, I haven't really noticed a difference, but again, not been using it a great deal. It's only had it two days. Uh, in terms of whether it connects quicker to the car, uh, nothing I can really tell. It was never really a problem with the previous car, so it's not like that's something you're really going to notice. The, the quality, the, the how quiet, you know, how much more quiet it is inside and the ride comfort you will notice. Like I say, it's not just wafty car, but it's just comfortable now. It's just fine, it's quiet. I used to say, you know, BMW i4 is a quieter, smoother car. I don't think that's the case anymore now. It really is very good, and as always, Tesla have continued to evolve their products. In terms of real world range and efficiency, again, there'll be more videos coming on that. Uh, so that for now will be it for this video. I'll run through all those little bits and pieces of difference and detail, including questions like what people asking about is door material is better again. So good to see that. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed. I'm going to do uh, a more uh, thorough review video about my opinions on how it drives and how it works, my experience without stalks in another video coming very soon. Plus, we've got some videos, and, and uh, as we put this to work, we're going to be driving it alongside other cars. So we'll be doing comparisons and efficiency in real-world range of this versus the other cars. What we've seen so far, it looks promising. The range is probably pretty similar to the previous long range. Maybe it is a tad better because it's a tad more efficient. Um, but it's not going to be night and day difference. It's not 50, 60, 800 miles more, I don't think. Um, but every little bit helps, and that's all good. So stay subscribed. More videos coming soon.